surgery yeah, in this area. So uh, I'm her designated introducer. So just pretend I have longer blonde hair and a couple inches taller. Um, I get the privilege of introducing Dr. Robert Sanborn from Children at Risk. Can you hear? Okay. Um, so I'm. Uh, Frida has written out the introduction, so pretend I'm Frida. It is my pleasure to introduce my friend, Dr. Bob Sanborn. He's the president and CEO of Children at Risk. Many of you may know this organization through school rankings that they publish for Houston each year, but it is so much more. Under Dr. Bob's leadership, it has become a powerful advocate for children's education, advising our legislators on policies and laws that improve the lives of children in Texas. He's drawn significant public awareness with media attention to issues that impact our children. This organization has also established centers for parenting and family well-being and to end, tra end trafficking and the exploitation of children. He received his undergraduate degree from Florida State University and his doctorate at Columbia University in New York City. Dr. Bob had a distinguished career in higher education at institutions such as Rice University and Hampshire College. He served as a senior leader for many organizations, bringing a focus of collaborations with like-minded groups, resources of developing partnerships, and a passionate belief that all children deserve extraordinary opportunities in order to succeed. Once when I voiced my frustration at the efforts of making a difference in a small way for a big problem, he told me this story. People along the river saw a baby floating in the water. One person jumped in to save the child. Soon, another baby was seen floating down the river and was also saved. Another baby was floating down the river and was saved. And finally, one person ran up the river to find the source of these tragedies. The point is that we need both kinds of help. People to save the babies floating down the river and people to address the causes of these problems. I've admired the work of Dr. Bob does for children in Texas and also for his generous spirit and effective communication skills. I must add that he's a fabulous creative chef and throws a heck of a great party. I know you'll enjoy his talk with us today, Dr. Bob Sandler. Thank you very much. How's everyone doing? Go Astros, huh? Yeah, isn't that great? I stayed up late watching that break. Well, that's not that late, right? What was it, 10.30 or so? It's not too bad. So, uh, Children at Risk has offices in Houston, Dallas, and Fort Worth, and we go all over the state of Texas. And so I spend time talking all over the state, and one of the things that struck me uh, is that, uh, and, and many of you know this with, with your own kids or your kids' kids, is that when people have children, right, especially that first child under the age of two, they often think, I think my child's a genius, right? You ever get that? Like, they're pretty sure their child is a genius. And, uh, and then the other thing that struck me, and before I had a child, I remember this, is that the parents of teenagers were like completely blunt, almost like too much. So that you know, he's not the sharpest tool in the shed, but, but we really love him. And, uh, and I didn't realize, I thought that was too blunt until I had a teenager myself, and I realized the whole deal. Uh, but children at risk in many ways is, is sort of like that parent of a teenager. We're very blunt about the status of our children in the state of Texas, but we also don't want to be people who are complaining without having the research and the data, uh, the best practices to show how do we come out of this, how do we do better uh, for our children. So we spent a lot of time uh, in Austin with our state legislature, making sure that they understand that there are ways out of this. When we look at the state of Texas, one in 10 children born in America is born in our state. So 10% of all the children born in America are born in the state of Texas. Yet when we also look at those children, 60% of our school children are low income. And if you know anything about research and public education and academic success, if you start out living in poverty, you're less likely to be academically successful. So that means we have 60% of the kids in our schools that sort of are starting behind the eight ball. Uh, children that are growing up in poverty or near poverty, 
and we're trying to figure out how to make sure that those kids are successful. Now, I know that some people in this room, and certainly I, I grew up in poverty. And all across our state, right, we see people who were the first in their family to go to college, they grew up in poverty, and they made it, right? We all know people like that. And we celebrate those successes. But in a sense, really, we celebrate them because they are anomalies. They aren't the norm. So what if it was the norm that if you grew up in poverty, you would be successful? Because right now, it isn't the norm. Right now, if you're a betting man and you look at the odds, if you grew up in poverty, the chances are that you will not be successful. We have lots of examples, and go to evidence of success, but the research shows that there isn't sort of a, a clear avenue for success. So one of the things that happened when I came to Children at Risk 12 years ago, uh, we started looking at, well, how can we make sure that this happens? And my belief at the time, and still was, that maybe there was one thing, I thought public schools. And when you look at the history of public education in our country, uh, the, the way that children have often moved from, from one economic area to the next, and this was true for me, was because you went to quality public schools and you had a teacher that intervened and held you by the hand, or maybe you went to a special church and someone held you by the hand, but schools became a key part of that. So I thought, well, what if we just found one good, in ranking schools, what if we just found one good high school that wasn't a magnet or a charter, that just served, just was a neighborhood that served predominantly low-income kids, and then we could use that as an example, right, to, to replicate. So 11 years ago when we did that, we found no high schools in the state of Texas that were neighborhood high schools that were performing in a way that all of us would be happy to send our kids to those schools, right? A high performing, high poverty high school. They didn't exist. So we sort of stepped back and said, okay, we need to look at the whole scheme of things. And we basically came up with this idea that there are four key things that if, if all of us, if, if this was the state legislature, and you guys came to me and you said, we know that you do research and you have a whole team of researchers. What does the evidence show if we were gonna really turn around child poverty, what could we do that isn't some harebrained idea but is based upon evidence and based upon facts? So there are really four things that we can look at that are sort of natural things and you'll get them as we talk about them. The first is we need to make parenting public policy, right? The idea that parents are sort of that first line of defense and we have to depend upon parents. And yet, when we did research in Dallas and in Houston to find out how many parents, affluent to poor, had access to evidence-based parenting education, only about 2% in each city had access to evidence-based parenting education. So right now, when a baby is born in a hospital, the fact that there's very rarely is there a, you know, there's a birthing class, there's a breastfeeding class, Sometimes there's a sibling class, but very rarely is, a, is there a parenting class. The whole idea of helping kids, helping families with the tools to be better parents. And there's no continuation of those classes either, right? When you get to the two-year-olds, those rocky, t terrible twos, and the threes, and then the, when they start going to kindergarten, and all these are sort of benchmarks and mileposts, yeah, we're not really necessarily helping parents, giving them the tools to be successful. And when we, when we continued with that research, when we, we would ask, are you interested in parenting education once you've had a child? And that was an interesting question, right? Because what we found is that African-American and white families, no matter the, the social economic status, were not very interested in parent education once they've had a kid. Oh, I already know how to do it. Latino families, which represent 54% of all the babies born in our state, they're like, yeah, I'd, I'd still use some help. I would love to know how to raise kids. And so I thought it was very interesting that we're not providing this information, even though it's very well, it's asked for by first time parents of all, of all types, and certainly by the majority of those that are having kids a second time. So parenting information and parenting education really needs to become more public policy. We have been able at the state of Texas level that whenever the state mandates parenting and education, which they do for messy divorces or for foster families, uh, we're, make, we're making sure that that, that is evidence-based, that these are research-based parenting classes. And the state is on board with us, but we need to make it much broader. The second thing is child care and early education. Having high quality child care and early education 
uh, can have a, a significant and dynamic impact on the life of children. One time I was testifying before the state legislature and they said, you know, hey, Dr. Sanborn, uh, what if, you know, if we can do any program to do dropout prevention or any program to do college prep, getting kids to go to college, what would you advise? And I said, well, the best, and the research shows that the best program that you can do for dropout prevention and college prep is by high quality early education, high quality child care. So right now, uh, about 70% of parents all across the state of Texas uh, are working parents. That means all the parents in the household work. And Texas is a working state, and, and very few moms or dads are staying at home. Only about 30% of homes have moms or dads that stay at home. 70% work. So that means for that, those 70% of families, they need to have this high quality child care. Yet in our state, when we look around, we see uh, child care deserts, deserts where there are no high quality child care seats for families. <laughs> And what the other thing that we understand is that there's a lot of warehousing of our children going on. So we understand, right, that those little genius two-year-olds, the reason we think they're geniuses is because this is when they're soaking it all up. This is when their brain's really developing. This is the high point of brain development is that two-year-old, two years old, when we really think they're geniuses. And so if at two years old, we're putting these kids in a, in a child care center that is safe and clean but no education, we're basically stunting the growth of those kids. And so all across the state of Texas, we are warehousing children in safe, clean places, but there's no education happening within those places. And this is a problem that catches up with us and catches up with workplace, workforce development and with our economy. So we've been real advocates for making sure we have high quality childcare, high quality early education. And then of course, pre-K, at four years old, we did a big study two years ago funded by the Meadows Foundation looking at pre-kindergarten programs. And the, the state funds half a day of pre-K. But what we found is that if you did half a day of pre-K, it really helped you academically. But if you did a full day of pre-K, it helped you a lot more than a half a day more. It was exponential in terms of uh, how academically ahead you became as a child. And so we've been pushing this whole idea of full day pre-K, especially for low income kids in our state. Uh, and what we get back a lot of times is, well, no, half a day is enough. And maybe they really should be staying at home with their parents, with their mom. And we think, well, 70% of our, of our families, they're out working, so there's no way to stay home. So we're basically saying, go ahead and warehouse those children. So we know that if you do this full day pre-K, and what, what, what we found is that a lot of school districts, HISD, Dallas ISD, almost all the districts in the Valley, have seen the research and are saying, we need to figure out a way to fund full day, even though the state's not paying for full day, because this is gonna make sure that we have academic success for these kids later on. The other thing that happens when a district just does half a day of pre-K is that a lot of parents who are working can't leave halfway through the day to go get those kids. So they end up just putting those kids back with that, that child care provider that's pretty cheap and pretty safe. And they do that because there's no way they could go half, halfway through the day to pick up their children. And so a lot of our very families that really need half-day pre-K uh, aren't getting that half-day pre-K. So then we move into the next big step, the, the really third thing, which is quality public schools. And we do the rankings of, we rank, uh, in the state of Texas, every single elementary, every single middle, and every single high school. And by and large, what you see is certainly that a lot of suburban schools that do quite well, some don't do as well, but we also see a lot of urban schools that are doing, at this point, that are doing extraordinarily well. So we have this group of schools called Gold Ribbon Schools, and these are high-performing, high-poverty schools. And in HISD, there are about 40 of these schools uh, sprinkled throughout certain areas. And, and what they have, all of them have certain factors that are really important. Uh, they have a strong principal, a, a, a principal, a leader, who really gets this idea that we need to change things. They have teachers that have this missionary zeal. They figure out a way to have more time on academic tasks. So that means a longer school day, a longer school year. So if you visit some of these places, what you find is that usually teachers are staying until five or six, or someone is there until five or six to do some tutoring. 
And then the other interesting thing that we found at these places is that often they have Saturday school. So it's not an official district policy, but they're saying the school is open and kids are coming and parents are bringing the kids and the teachers are there to help. And so that becomes more time on academic tasks. And when you look at the United States in terms of time on academic tasks compared to other countries, in Texas we have about 170 school days, as opposed to Germany, which has about 200, uh, to Japan, 220, Korea, 230. So we have a fewer amount of school days in the United States than any of the other industrialized nations. And so the, everyone else gets this idea of time on academic tasks. The more time you spend academically, the better it's gonna be for you. Now, if you live in a household where your parents are both college educated and you continue the learning after the kids get home, that's time on academic tasks, so that sort of works. But if your parents did go to college, and if they're working and they tell you, come home, you know, lock the door and study and do your homework, what do kids do? They come home, they lock the door, and they turn on TV and they turn on the video games, and the minute that they hear the mom pull up or the dad pull up, they turn it all off and they pretend to be doing it. I was a kid too, come on. So, so one of the things we understand is that this whole idea of academic time on task becomes very important. Uh, the fourth thing is really creating at these schools a, a culture of high expectations. And one of the things when we see around the, around the world, whenever we see turnaround schools, they've always changed that culture, where it's a culture of you are gonna be successful, we're gonna make sure you're gonna be successful. We see some schools, that do the whole idea of no excuses, you know, this whole idea we're gonna do everything possible to make sure uh, that we're successful. And then the final thing that they do is that they sort of follow the data. When kids don't do well on a test, immediate intervention. Let's figure out how that we can make, make sure that this kid does well. So when we see those five characteristics, and inevitably, if you're a high-performing, high-poverty school, you have to be doing all five, because if you're missing out on one or two of them, Usually you're not a high performing, high poverty school. So we know what it takes to turn around schools. We also know, interestingly though, is that not enough training is happening in regards to leadership, to training those principles. So the, the key area for us is often those sort of really important and really powerful school leaders. And much like all of you know that to run a business, it's not gonna be successful without a good leader. Same with schools. They, they're not going to be successful without a good leader, and so we need to make sure that we have enough leaders. The next thing that happens, the fourth thing that really need in terms of turning around poverty, is making sure that those kids graduate and go into a career or college, right? Career program or college. In the state of Texas today, uh, we send about as many people into occupational programs or career programs as any other state. What we don't do a good job is of sending smart kids to college. Right now, Texas sends fewer kids to college than almost any other state. Uh, when we look at the population numbers, we see sometimes that we're in the bottom, but we're not at the bottom in terms of young 25-year-olds with a bachelor's degree. The reason we're not at the bottom is because we do a very good job of recruiting kids from other states, young people from LSU, from OU, from everywhere else to come work in Texas but we're not really good at producing our own college graduates. And if any of you have ever visited some of the high schools on the east side or on the north side, what you start to see is there are a lot of good kids, a lot of really smart kids that aren't even thinking about college uh, in Texas or in Houston. And that needs to change. We need to have more kids that start thinking about college that go to college. And here's another really interesting thing. If you look across the country at the 10 schools, with the, the 10 colleges with the highest dropout rates, Seven of the 10 are in Texas. So if you decide in Texas that you wanna to go to college, the chances of you graduating once you make that decision are very low. So if you look just in Houston at the schools where most of our first generation college students go, the University of Houston downtown and Texas Southern University, and so they have a 15 and 11% graduation rate, six year graduation rate respectively. So here you have, we're doing all this, you know, you have me saying, go to college, go to college, go to college, you're smart. And then you choose the college that, that seems right for you. You take out debt, you get into the college, and then you're, the, again, you're not likely to be successful because the odds are against you. And so we, we look at that as well, and we can see, you know, if, if that same student chose UT, a and or Texas Tech, 
sticking with just public schools, we see that the average rate of graduation for those kids is significantly higher in those sort of welcoming communities of learning. But when you go to a college where it just seems like it's another institution, it's just like an extension of your high school, less likely to be successful because you have so many other things uh, pulling at you. I'll tell you one other uh, story before I open it up to questions. Um, and um, I'll tell you two stories. Uh, one is that we really believe that public policy, the power of public policy, the power of legislation, to really change things. And so when we talk about these four characteristics of how do we end poverty, uh, we really believe that the more legislation that we can pass, the more we can get legislators to see this, the, the more things will happen. It's sort of systems change. And so two other issues that we work on, one is uh, human trafficking. So about 11 years ago, I wrote an op-ed for the Houston Chronicle where I said, Houston is the hub of human trafficking in America. And at that time, we, a lot of us had not heard about human trafficking, right? So what is human trafficking and why is Houston the hub? And law enforcement at the time was like, well, why are you saying this? We don't have cases of human trafficking. And the reason that there were no cases of human trafficking 10, 11 years ago is because we didn't really have any anti-human trafficking laws on the books. So in 2003, um, we did pass a piece of legislation in Texas that made human trafficking illegal. And pretty much it was that simple. It was in the transportation code and it said human trafficking is illegal. No one was ever prosecuted under that. And so in 2007, we went to the state legislature and we introduced seven pieces of legislation in the fight against trafficking. And one of the pieces that we introduced was, we wanna make sure that law enforcement, when they have to go back for their continuing education, that they are trained in human trafficking and understanding human trafficking uh, and really understanding what are, what's all the data on human trafficking. Because of that one piece of legislation, Today, when we walk into a police department, uh, everyone understands exactly what we're talking about. And Texas is really one of, the, one of the great places where law enforcement works with us to really end trafficking. And since that first time when we passed seven pieces of legislation, we've passed over 60 pieces of anti-trafficking legislation, really giving law enforcement and prosecutors the tools necessary to go after trafficking. And so that's been a real, real help to us but still, we still feel like we're on the tip of the iceberg. Uh, but that's legislation and policy in action. The second story is uh, a couple of years ago, we started seeing all the research on kids who don't get breakfast aren't going to do well academically. And anyone who's ever been a teacher knows a teacher knows that hungry kids, you know, they want food, they're inattentive, they're not really learning. A lot of teachers in, in urban schools were bringing food into the classroom to make sure kids can get snacks so they could start to learn. So the U.S. Department of Agriculture came to us and said, you know that we can make this easy. We will fund any low-income school, we'll fund any of them to do universal free breakfast. We will give that money so that you can, everyone can get breakfast in the school if the majority is lo our low-income kids. And so we went to our state legislature and we said, why don't we do a, a piece of legislation Mandate because first we tried to visit with every uh, every food service director and they're like, well, we're not used to doing this. It's going to be a little bit and and then super, superintendents would find out, say, oh, we can do this. And we visited one one district here in Galena Park. We went to Galena Park and they said, oh yeah, we are happy to do free school breakfast. We only do it in April during testing, but we're happy to do it. <laughs> and but they see, but they got it right. They got that kids do better. You can go in the park now at Universal Breakfast all, all the time, so they come around. So we went to the legislature and we said, listen, instead of us visiting every place and getting all this pushback, why don't we just pass legislation? And we had a legislator who's not there any longer, and he said, I really think kids should eat breakfast with their families, not at school. And, and, and I get that, right? I mean, I want my daughter to eat breakfast with me, I get that. But if I'm working and I can't afford breakfast in the first place, you know what, we're basically telling those kids that they can't have breakfast. So we reframed it and we went to Kel Seliger, who's a senator from Amarillo. And we said, Senator, you have more cows in your district per capita than any other district. And you know, this is a, this is a big thing for the milk industry, making sure that we get universal free school breakfast. 
And then we said this represents a $350 million investment annually in Texas agriculture. That bill sailed through the Senate <laughs> and sailed through the Governor Perry at the time to the big signing ceremony. And in one fell swoop, a million more children every day were getting breakfast in one fell swoop. And for us, that was again the power of public policy that we could do a law and a million children every day would be getting breakfast. So that was a big deal. Uh, Every day, every uh, Monday at Children's Rest, we have our staff meeting. The people from our state offices call in. And we always end, and we say, someone says, for children. And everyone re responds back, for children. So let's try that here before I, before I open the questions. For children. For children. For children. For children. For children. You guys, you can be staff at Children's Rest. So very good. So let's open it up to some questions. I'm happy to answer any questions about anything. Yes. So, uh, what are your thoughts about longer academic years uh, year round schooling? You know, there was this experiment with year round schooling where they had little breaks, you know, throughout the year, like every six weeks or every eight weeks. And parents hated that, right? Because you had kids that were on different schedules. So, more school is research shows it's a good idea. But I think many of us now in the school reform movement would like the idea of just a longer school year with still a summer. You know, it's one of those cultural hurdles that I think is just going to be too hard to get over. So I think all of us like this idea, and frankly, that's what other countries do mostly. It's just they give some sort of break. But I think the other thing that we need to do, though, is make sure that... Is that me? I think it's me. Okay. I think the other thing we need to make sure, though, is that uh, summertime doesn't become a time where a lot of kids really just lose everything that they've learned, or a lot of what they've learned. So we need to figure out ways to have more useful summertime. The other thing is uh, Brian Green, who's the head of the Food and I, he and I always talk about, we have a radio show, I have a radio show on the Pacific Radio Network called Growing Up in America. And we talk about, people often think Thanksgiving and Christmas are the big hunger times. Indeed, children are much more hungry during the summer because schools have stopped serving breakfast and lunch. And a couple years ago, we got districts across the state to do June, uh, lunch and uh, June breakfast and that minimized a lot of summer summer hunger but still July and half of August very hungry and a lot of learning not going on yes you you mentioned um, parent education yeah but I'm I'm curious about the impact of even taking a step back further to marriage education or relationship education um, and I say that because I was shocked in reading the book Coming Apart, that just among white Americans, 50% yep. of children are born out of wedlock. Yeah. And then you take into account divorce rates yep. at 50%, and the impact of single parents raising children. And this may be beyond the purview of your children are risk, yeah. but it is, I think it so does important. contribute and is important. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Um, and I guess a second question would be the impact of, of charter schools like Yes College Prep and KIPP. And what Those are like two completely different questions. <laughs> they're, they're two questions, sorry. Uh, so, so uh, I'm like getting old, like I have the one track mind, so you'll have to remind me of the second question. But So the first question, uh, more education never hurt anyone, right? I mean, this is the thing. Right, there are not a lot of, there, I mean, a lot of churches do evidence-based couples courses. Uh, evidence-based pre-marriage counseling. Uh, so all of those things are really good. I think I think a lot of us poo-poo that stuff when we see it. Like, oh, come on, I hate that. Especially husbands. Oh, come on. <laughs> you know, but the fact is, is that it is good, right? That stuff is really good. And every time my wife dragged me to some sort of couples, you know, retreat type thing, I, and I was like, oh, come on. Uh, but I was better off for it, right? So I think, yes, those are really good things. But I think when it comes to our children, right, the whole idea of doing evidence-based parenting, uh, one, of the, one of the byproducts, of the great byproducts, is sort of sanity and mental health on the part of parents. If you know what to do when that kid is having a tantrum, it's fantastic, right? You just sort of, there are steps to dealing with this. And if you know where to go on the internet and to see a video of how you stop your child from doing this, that's a really good thing. And when you hear other parents 
say, oh no, I put the kibosh on technology and I, it's not their diary, I'm gonna, you know, those are helpful things. And we're not doing enough of that right now in terms of supporting each other as parents. Charter schools, so, um, Kip and yes, the guys over there, the, the people that run those schools are good friends of mine. They do an extraordinary job at Kip and yes, and uh, the other one is Idea, which is in the Valley. Uh, they're great charter schools. They'll also know that I will say there's also a lot of really bad charter schools, right? So when so sometimes parents hear charters and they think about Kip and yes, all charters are not Kip and yes. There's some really bad charter schools, and we work really hard to shut those down. Um, <clears throat> So I would say parents need to sort of explore that. I think that we have choices is fantastic, right? That you can choose an HISD, you can choose your neighborhood school, or you can choose some other school, or you can choose a magnet school, or you can choose a charter. You know, that's the marketplace at its best. And, and I see it as a researcher, I see it working for children and families uh, in Houston. And it's harder in suburban areas or rural areas to have sort of that same mix uh, but but choices are good things. And I could go on and on about the data around uh, vouchers in Texas, but I won't because that's sort of politically hot as well. So, Yes? You've given us a lot of uh, eye-opening statistics there, Doctor, and I have a question about the graduation uh, percentages you had said from private schools, colleges in particular. Oh, you said yeah. that uh, the uh, independent or rather the public colleges have a higher graduation level than they do for private schools, I believe, and you said because of, no? No, no. So I was just comparing uh, UHD and Texas Southern to UT, A&M, and Texas Tech. So those three, those last three, have higher graduation rates than UHD and Texas Southern. And why is that? Then? Oh yeah, see, it's uh, this whole welcoming community. Uh, there are a couple reasons, but there's the main one is this: it's this welcoming community. There are programs in place to help uh, first-generation college students to make sure that they're successful. Uh, I went to Florida State as a, as a first generation college student, and there were programs in place to really help me be successful. And whenever we see programs like that in public schools, we know that they're gonna have a higher graduation rate. California has demographics almost equal to Texas in terms of the percentage of economically disadvantaged, racial makeup. They have significantly higher graduation rates than some of our schools. So there are things that we can do to make sure that our schools have better graduation rates, yes? Dr. Sandra, I'm Dom Sweat at Boise Girls Harbor. I appreciate your work. One of the things I've asked you about children, um, there are many children out there who never think about going to college. Right. Never. They, they right. don't think they can, they don't think they can afford it, they don't think they can leave, they, et cetera. Right. What are your thoughts about, number one, trade schools, and number two, about education for those on private area versus commercial or state? What do you mean the last part of it? Education by private area? Well, we're seeing, uh, I believe Harris County is getting into some trade school work. Uh, San Jack College is getting into trade schools, et cetera. So I'm saying private, maybe on campuses that have kids like we do, okay, versus that. I'd like to hear your yeah. comments. So the, the key thing, right, is making sure that every single one of our kids, when they come out of high school, they've either already done trade, or they're gonna do trade, or they're going to college, or they're going to the military. Right? I mean, to be successful, you need to do one of those things. 60% of our jobs uh, say that you need to have some sort of college education. The other 40% know you need a trade. The days when you can graduate from high school, my buddy Steve Feinberg always says, the days when you can graduate from high school and walk down to the Ford plant and get a high paying job, those days no longer exist. So we need to figure out a way to make sure that kids are getting that. And so. Uh, we do need to send more kids to college, the data is clear on that. that. That's sort of the biggest thing. But the next thing is having really good trade programs uh, to make sure the kids have those. There's, a, there's one called Genesis Works. You familiar with that, Don? And Genesis Works is a nonprofit, and they go into schools where kids are getting D's and stuff, and they say, hey, why don't you join this work through your high school? It's sort of like the old what, distributive education, right? Except it's much more sleek and way better and uh, they're doing a really good job. They started here in Houston, and they've expanded around the country, so they're a good program. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, the one question I had was, uh, is Houston still a major hub for human trafficking? Houston is absolutely one of the major hubs for human trafficking. 
we have more illicit brothels in our town that we can count than we have Starbucks. And so uh, we have so many in Houston, and it's, what's interesting is that our researchers, all they have to do, is, it's like it's not even clandestine research, because all the people that go to these brothels, they go online to review what's happening, and so you can just find out what's happening, because everything's online, you know, what, what's happening in each of these brothels, massage parlors that are masquerading as brothels, or brothels that are masquerading as massage parlors. Uh, we do this uh, human trafficking tour at Children Risk where we get in the bus. First, you spend an hour learning about trafficking, and then we take you on the bus and we show you some of the spot, hot spots for trafficking so you can see what it looks like. One of them's right near the Galleria. Right near the Galleria, we have all this stuff going on. Right near Hobby Airport, we have lots of trafficking going on. Uh, and when we have, uh, I'm friends with Anise Parker, but when she did that deal with, uh, with the 20 strip clubs, the 16 strip clubs, where they give a million dollars and then the city doesn't bother them, uh, you know, I called it a deal with the double blood money and the New York Times ran a big thing. She hated me for like two weeks. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that those strip clubs are sort of part of this web of trafficking and it contributes uh, to why we're, we are a hub. I would say that, you know, Atlanta and LA and Phoenix have become big hubs as well. Uh, any city that supports uh, large populations that buy these girls, right? So we're, we are a hub, not because we're on I-10, not because we're near the border, but because we have men who will spend money to buy young women. And when we don't have demand, we will no longer have supply. But as long as we have demand, as long as we have men who will pay money for young women and young girls, we're going to be a hub. So that's the... I'm sorry? Young boys that are just sort of part of this boys will be boys tradition. You know, I could do a whole 20 minutes on that, by the way, so, yes. I was wondering, uh, what can people like me and everyone else here do to kind of help, you know, I mean, we know that there are all these issues with child education and everything like that, policies in place, but what can we do, you know, to help improve uh, you know, the, the children at risk? Yeah, so two things. So I outlined the four things of how we could end poverty. For you to find out what are the organizations in our town that are doing especially good job in those areas, like what are the good child care areas that we can help? Well, we can tell you the small steps, Yellowstone Academy. We can tell you the places that are doing extraordinary work uh, in each of those areas and supporting those places. But then secondly, really talking to state legislat le le legislators and saying, we need to do something about this. You know, uh, about three years ago, we started complaining that no one was talking about poverty anymore. You know, at least, and, and, and for the first five years of the Obama administration, he never mentioned poverty in his State of the Union address. And we were like, something needs to change. And then finally, some things have started to change. People are talking about it more. But we need to address this idea that 60% of our kids are low income, and we're going to need to do something to turn that around to make sure that we have this vibrant state, uh, this vibrant economy in this state that we need. Yes, sir. Um, I've got two questions. One is I wonder if you could just expand a little bit on what the metrics you are that you use specifically when you're ranking schools. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming graduation rates is one of them, but I'm hoping there's more than that. And then a follow-up is uh, in your advocacy, are any of your efforts focused on the, uh, you know, you, you, you joked earlier about everyone thinking their kid's a genius. Yeah. Uh, does any of your advocacy uh, address the needs of gifted and talented students? Because I am an educator, and I think that is one of the greatest shortcomings I've seen in public education is we have fabulous programs for young children in, that are, you know, that we believe are gifted and talented. But you get the secondary level, and they evaporate. Those programs are non-existent. And I've seen firsthand so many gifted kids regress to the mean because they're not challenged. Yeah, and I'll then, answer that first, then you'll have to remind me of the first question. Sure. But uh, the idea that we have magnet schools in our state, uh, and certainly in, in Houston ISD, Dallas ISD, those are great places for that continuation of, mag of uh, the gifted and talented. I agree with you, there's not enough for some of those kids. Uh, but what happens many times, right, in a lot of districts across the state, is that uh, if, you, if you have some affluence and your child is not meeting, they're not getting their needs met, you pull them and you put them in private school. 
But then we have all these families that uh, don't have the abilities to do that, and they're still stuck in the, the schools, that, and, and their talented and gifted child now gets down to the lowest denominator. So yeah, we've been big proponents of high-functioning magnet schools uh, and standalone magnet schools because we see the, the good things. What was your first question? Just what metrics do you use? Oh, metrics, okay, yeah, and the ranking. So, for high school, so we measure elementaries, middle, and high schools, and each one of them we do a little bit differently. Uh, we look uh, three baskets for elementary and middle school, basically. We do look at how they're doing on their tests, and but remember, we, we started this with this idea that any one of us would want to send our, if, if your school's gonna get an A or a B, it'd have to be that any one of us would be happy to send our kids to that school. So we look at the test and we look at the mastery level. So how are they doing mastery-wise, not just satisfactory-wise in each subject matter? Uh, and at elementary middle, that's just going to be reading and math. Uh, but then we also do a thing where we compare uh, uh, demographically equal schools to each other. So if your school has 80% poverty and uh, demographic, racial demographics, or whether we compare you to a whole pool that's similar to you and see how you do. Uh, and then we look at growth. How are kids doing year to year one school year to the next school year, we're able to look at student data, individual student data in the school. At the high school, we do all those same things, except we add, we look at SAT and ACTs, uh, we also look at a, a, AP testing and IB, and then we also look at a graduation rate that we have created, we don't use the state's graduation rate because we think it's too, uh, too many loopholes that, that school districts use, so we use that. So that's a long explanation, but uh, we do that, and. We meet with all the statisticians from all the school districts for them to give us input. They'd like us to be easier on them, but we're not. Sometimes the superintendents hate us, by the way. So. Final question. All right. As far as education for parents is, um, we came from the Northeast where it was kind of public school first, private school was not the norm, and it seemed to be reversed when we came to Houston. Do you educate parents on, you know, the idea that there is, you know, this magnet lottery and all these other options. You don't just have to go to your local neighborhood school. Yeah, we do a lot of that. We have a website called texasschoolguide.org that really helps people decide where some of those schools are. The Walton Foundation funds us a lot to do specifically that for parents to understand that there are lots of choices. We focus on sort of lower income to understand those choices uh, because uh, as, as you're more fluent, you're gonna have more access to some of those types of things. But uh, interestingly, though, where did you move from in the Northeast? New Jersey. Jersey? Yeah. So I, I moved from New York City, right? There are, percentage-wise, there are more kids in private school in New York City than there are in public school uh, compared to Houston. So just as an interesting thing. Well, hopefully Dr. Bob can stay after for a few minutes for uh, some one-on-one -on -one questions. But thank you very much. Thank we you guys very much.